So we pick up this twisty, tangled bit of string that is chapter 7, verses 7 through 25, as I already said. There's a diatribe or prosopoeia, uh, that is Paul, continuing to channel the voice of a Gentile who has made the attempt to completely follow Judaism as a consequence of following Jesus, but realize that, uh, realizes that this is a, f a false road. So this is not a tortured Christian beset by sin for eternity. The key is in verses 24 and 25 when Paul exalts with a victorious, triumphal Christian, uh, you know, when he, when he says that. And it's also found with the notion of flesh, that is the sarks. And the flesh is just the flesh and blood that makes a person a person. And so that Gentile flesh could not be undone except for, except for uh, a new spirit comes along. And so we get to chapter 8 and uh, the final and, and ultimate metaphor after married status, adopted as children. In Now, we, we have to remember that in Romans 7, the flesh plays a pivotal role, that Paul talks about the weakness of the flesh. The flesh is overrun by sin. The, the flesh can't, can't respond. It's overrun. And so the spirit is going to be that which supplies strength. So let's read verses 1 through 17. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So having moved away from, the, from sin and moved into Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. So that pretty much tells us that Romans 7 is supposed to be a problem solved, not a problem ongoing. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who, set, who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So I hope, as I'm moving through, I hope you're recalling the, the substantial pieces of argument from Romans 3, 4, five, six, and seven, where these contrasts are, these contrasts you see are reaching their point of conclusion. The Jewish and Gentile mix uh, in Rome, and I cannot uh, argue that there would be Jews who'd be reading this too, but this argument wouldn't hit them in the same way. A Gentile who would be under the pressure to respond to Judaism in some way, these are the folks who Paul has in mind. Um, and so, and so he, this is the ongoing argument to set the flesh, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So reconciliation, peace. Notice again, the push and pull of the objective moment, the cross once and for all, Good Friday, the subjective moment that is somehow our awakening, our call, our new direction, having received the proclamation of Jesus's call and the, the new life that's offered to us. The news, really, right? It, it, it's the news that Jesus has done this, that God has done this in Jesus. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So that's a rejoinder from chapter 7. And then comes the good news. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So Romans 5, right? 1 through 5. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. So notice how Paul is even saying that your mortal body, your flesh and blood, will receive 
that new life in you. I can only suggest that that has to do with hope and that has to do with the optimistic outlook rather than a fatalistic one. This love that God pours into the human heart that may have been absent uh, in, in other ways. Um, the spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we're debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. So Paul says, when we cry, Abba, Father, verse 16, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is to me, uh, it spills right over to the present sufferings. This was this is almost a, a rejoinder from Second Corinthians uh, four and five. The creation was subjected futile and subjected to futility, but now the children of God who are on their way will pro, pro, will allow the new creation to have full expression. We groan inwardly while we wait for adoption. This pull and tug, push and pull, in hope we were saved. Now hope is not seen. Is not hope, um, but we hope and we wait with patience. And the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Here's where Paul says we don't even know how to pray right, but the Spirit intercedes for us. And so, um, one thing about Romans 8:28, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. You got to be careful not to get trapped in verse 8:28. People get trapped here all the time. They issue a pious platitude. All things work together for good. Sometimes they don't. So uh, be careful not to trap yourself or one another in this kind of a expression. Uh, what does that mean? That means you God just doesn't rescue people uh, from their, I mean, no more than he rescued Jesus from suffering. So to think that just everything's going to work out all right, grit your teeth and smile, and, and sometimes that's not the best counsel to give a person, right? That's all I mean. But do I trust that God can redeem anything? Absolutely. God is in the best. God's at God's best when we're at our worst or we're in our worst. So I want to go back and pick up 1 through 17 and the adoption metaphor. This is what Paul's building toward. He starts out with Abraham, the father of Jews and Gentiles alike. He establishes and moves through uh, the household of uh, the Roman household. And uh, starting with the slave who would greet you at the door, maybe one of the clients, a freed person who'd be on the inside of the house, and uh, perhaps the wife, uh, as you move into the interior relationships of the Roman household. There were no doors on a Roman house. Did you know that? There were just porticos. You could see right in all the way through to the end. When you entered a Roman home on the one side, you'd see a niche with all the uh, homes, uh, little gods and goddesses. Uh, Roman statuary. Um, houses were arranged like a big courtyard in the middle and then small rooms uh, are surrounding it. Um, the kitchen uh, would be the place that maybe had a roof where the fire was attended to all the time. The, um, sometimes the houses wouldn't have roofs uh, over the courtyard but over the other uh, little rooms uh, alongside. But that's where all business was conducted, and that's where all things Roman took place. The home was the center of it all. And so Paul knows that, and he writes with these metaphors to try to drive home his notion that Gentiles are just as welcome in the community of faith as the Jew. How does he pull it off? Well, he pulls it off by getting to the idea of uh, adoption. To get there, though, he first has to state Again, the objective and subjective natures of salvation and sanctification. For God has done what the law weakened. This is God's justice. God has done what the law could not do by sending his own son. So we go back to that moment. God is righteous. God is just. And how do we know God is just? Because given the sin problem of Genesis 3, God did not enforce a punishment that could not be born. Instead, he, uh, he does something that no one could have foreseen 
by sending his own son. So, um, so he talks about the direction in life. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the flesh, but but those who set live according to the spirit. Wish I knew what that meant. Um, it, live according to the spirit. He doesn't spell it out very well. Now he may set up some things about love and the virtues and 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 that kind of thing. The spirit, though, to me, requires explanation. And and so I want to try to walk you through that just to a, a little bit, uh, just a little bit. So spirit occurs seventeen times, seventeen times, in chapter eight. And spirit is not a nothing, but a something. In Paul, a, the spirit, the combination of the two Greek elements of fire and air, a Stoic mindset. Stoicism was in the air, just like materialism is in our air. Um, the spirit was a divine energy life force that came from the stars, and every person had a spark of it. Now, I think Paul would be different here from his Stoic brothers and sisters. Remember, the greatest Stoic that we know of uh, would be Seneca, who's living at the same time and is the brother of Gallio, the Corinthian judge who's only there for a year because of his health. But in any case, Seneca is the one who talks this way. We get a lot of information from Seneca. So what is the spirit? The spirit is a real life force, and it's the life force of the resurrected Christ that energizes the human person. So Paul has moved from slave to free to married to adopted the highest status. Adopted status, uh, beginning with Julius to Augustus, Augustus to Tiberius and Caligula, uh, Cal Claudius to Nero, there was a chain of uh, adoptions where the Roman family spirit, the Genius, was th that was the Roman protective family spirit. And when you were adopted, you inherited that family spirit as well. In the Roman Empire, therefore, it was really important that that family spirit continue on. If the Roman Empire had enjoyed success, it was imperative that that success continue through and through. And so uh, this uh, was a, extremely important. And I, my argument is that the Genius, the Roman family spirit, is the analogous piece for Paul's metaphor of adoption. We have been adopted by the Spirit of Christ. We no longer have the other kind of spirit, the spirit that would allow us to be still succumb. Iconography, the Roman genius was pictured like this. The Augustus is here. This is a generic one over here, but definitely in the Augustan style, the family spirit was imaged this way. So uh, really a togated, which would be uh, pious, you know, with an offering. These are two wall reliefs that show two other alternative images of the Roman genius in the form of the snake. You see the snakes right here. Now this one right here is from the ho a house in Pompeii. Here's the genius right here. And then this snake, of course these are snakes as well. Here's the genius. These are also cooperating images related to, um, you know, generation. So not for nothing that the snake becomes the visual representation of uh, what's personified on either side of the genius is a lar. These lars are also family spirits, the celebratory spirits. Um, and so I think that the Roman genius, the Roman family spirit, that occupied the attention of the Roman Empire, Paul suggests we are getting a new family spirit. And that new family spirit is the family of Christ, that his spirit. It's his spirit that makes us capable for doing the work that, that God puts, uh, not doing the work, but for being incorporated. This is what makes, just like Augustus was Octavian before Julius adopted him, and that adoption provided all the benefits. Now Christ has adopted us. God has adopted us in Christ. And that has given us strength and status that Gentiles are every bit to be considered a part of the community of faith as their Jewish brothers and sisters. This is the clinching argument, I think, the climactic moment in Paul's argumentation when he says, we cry out, Abba, Father. That's an incredibly dear way. We're going to look at 9 through 11 and the rest in later lectures.